Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Way of Hope this morning. Welcome uh, online. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning as well. Um, just a little note to our Facebook friends that are live. Uh, Facebook doesn't support anymore the landscape view, so you see us in portrait now. Uh, I know that makes it a little more, I don't know, unfriendly in my opinion. But hang in there with us. Uh, hopefully that they'll change their mind and get enough uh, response from people to change back to the landscape view. Makes it a little more enjoyable for people to watch. But we appreciate you uh, joining with us both here in person and online both. Uh, thanks for being here. It really shows that you care about God's word. I mean, it's Christmas time. We're telling an old, old story again and again and again and again. But you being here, uh, present with us, either in person or online, uh, just really shows that you care about God's word, you care about God's kingdom, you care about God. Um, and honestly, that's really an encouragement to me. The fact that people care about God and God's word, um, that helps me get up on Sunday morning and do this week in and week out, week in and week out. Because we know that God's word changes lives. And we're going to talk about Jesus again today. And uh, just some of the things that he's done all across history. Um, and it's pretty uh, phenomenal whenever you put it all together and you hear it. Um, it's, just, it's just an amazing thing. So thank you. This is the stuff that keeps me going. Because again, I have to tell you an age old story again. And I get about, uh, I don't know eight or nine chapters in the whole entire Bible on the birth of Jesus. So it's not a ton of stuff to work with, but um, I'm grateful. This is the second Sunday in Advent uh, as we're making our way towards uh, Christmas and Christmas Eve, I should say, and Christmas. Uh, I do want to remind you that we will have the children's program on the 24th in the AM service. We will have Christmas Eve at seven o'clock, uh, Christmas Eve. So keep those dates uh, in mind uh, as we uh, approach uh, Christmas time, Christmas day. Today, uh, we want to look at 2 Kings. We've been going through uh, the Bible book by book and trying to pick out a verse that kind of uh, brings some meaning or tells us a little bit about the story or the message. And uh, we're in 2 Kings uh, today. Actually, uh, 2 Kings, there's actually two books of Kings. It was at one time one book. Uh, it was split in two by those that, that built the canon of the Bible, if you will, put the books together. Um, so it comes from 2 Kings uh, chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. It says, And the people of Israel persisted in all the evil ways of Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam was uh, King David's right-hand man. He was a warrior, uh, and uh, he ended up to be the king of one part of Israel, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. It goes on, it says, They did not turn from these sins. The people of Israel persisted in their evil ways, the evil ways of Jeroboam, and they did not turn from these sins until the Lord finally swept them away from his presence, just as all his prophets had warned so Israel was exiled from their land to Assyria, where they remain uh, to this day. I said last week, um, well, let me say this first. First and Second Kings is really a book or two books of man's rule of God's kingdom. Keep that in mind. Um, last week I said First King uh, records the division of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, actually split okay and the northern tribe the northern ten tribes they follow Jeroboam again this is King David's right-hand man warrior okay and the tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the south they remain loyal to the throne of King David so now you have the nation of Israel the 12 tribes and they split the north and the south so it's important to keep that in mind when you're reading the scripture Second Kings, uh, the first Kings talks about the division, if you will, and the falling apart and starting to worship idols. Second Kings records the collapse of the kingdom. Neither the northern kingdom, which is Israel, nor the southern kingdom, which we call Judah, neither one of them kept the law of Moses and worshiped God at Jerusalem. So 
God takes them to account. And both of them are taken into captivity by enemy nations. Israel is taken to Assyria in captivity. And Judah falls to Babylon. Uh, which is just what God promised them would happen if they disobeyed his law way back in Deuteronomy whenever he gave them the law he says if you disobey me and you don't follow me anymore bad stuff is going to happen to you and that's exactly what happened and the lesson really of these two books is the throne on earth must be in tune Listen carefully. The throne on earth must be in tune with the throne in heaven if blessings are to come and benefits are supposed to stack up or accrue to the people. Do you hear that? We need to be in tune with the kingdom of God. <clears throat> we can't go our own way. Man's plan cannot overthrow God's purpose. And that's what we see in the book of 1st and 2nd Kings. We see how man decides to take it on themselves to lead the nation of Israel. They start to worship idols. They fall apart. They're divided. And they're led into slavery and captivity in both Assyria and Babylon. So keep that in mind when we talk about how we need to be honoring God as a nation. Um, a lot of that stuff is still in play today. You know, God is going to... Uh, remove his blessings from us if we're not in tune with the throne in heaven. So pray with me as we uh, give God some praise today and then uh, we'll sing a little bit. Lord, today we are just so grateful again to gather here today and just to be around people who uh, so enjoy God's word that they would give up their time, Lord, to be here, uh, to sit in your presence, Lord, to worship you. Uh, we know that your ways and your thoughts and your purposes are much higher than ours. And Lord, as we read through Scripture, as we take it to heart, we understand, Lord, that you desire that we worship you and honor you and praise and exalt you in every way. And Lord, we also understand that when we don't, when we seem to go our own way, when we decide to be our own King and Lord, um, that comes with some pretty serious consequences. So Lord, today we are here as your people. We admit to you that we are sinners that we fall completely short of what you really call us to be. But Lord, we've confessed you as Lord and Savior. And we need you. We need your grace and we need your mercy. And we are here, Lord, to humble ourselves and to worship you as you rightfully deserve and to lift your name on high. We thank you that you've come to save us. So today, Lord, we praise you for all of this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's stand if you're able and let's sing.
It's time for the church to arise in a powerful way. Amen? Amen. Have a seat. For our stewardship moment this morning, uh, from the book of Mark chapter 1. It says, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they had confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locust and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This morning as we give, again, just want to call your attention to the screen and the ways that you can do that to continue to spread Jesus' name and build the kingdom of God. If you can utilize those, we would certainly appreciate it. We appreciate all of your giving. So pray with me and I invite you to come and give. Lord, uh, we're humbled again to be here this morning. Um, as we bring our tithes and offerings to you, Lord, we are reminded that we're called to prepare the way, to be the designers of peace, to be the builders of justice. We're supposed to be the producers of kindness. You've called us the church to arise. And we pray the day that our giving continues to point to the Christ who comes in love and compassion. May our giving in this season reflect our hope for the promised kingdom to reign in our world. We pray today, Lord, come, Jesus, come. We ask now for your blessings on the giver and on what has been given. May your will always be done, Lord. Through us we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and give as the Lord lays on your heart. A little Christmas tune for you this morning. Of all the years 
Take a couple minutes to uh, lift up some prayer requests. Oh, yeah, I can't talk today. I'm trying to think and write and talk and all that at the same time. Prayer requests. How shall we pray today? Uh, let me just make a note before we start here. If uh, you're online this morning and you have a few, get them in. Type them in so that Steph can get them to us here. I know there's a little lag this morning, about a minute or so, so... How shall we pray today? All right, go ahead, Lisa. Uh, I have a prayer for a friend, Sue. Um, she's going through a lot of personal issues. On top of that, she lost a good friend. Her name is Tina this week due to um, cancer. Uh, Tina happened to be the one that I, I only did one baptism in my life. Tina was the one. So my prayer is for her, too, that she has finally found her peace. Okay. But uh, Sue's dealing with a lot of issues and she needs a lot of prayers too. Alright. So I want to keep Sue and uh, the passing of Tina in prayer there. Okay. Go ahead, Miss Cindy. Yeah, um, on my finger. Ah. Okay. Miss Cindy. Got her uh, finger stuck where it shouldn't have been for a while, huh? And really tore it up there, so. Okay. Who else? Mr. Chris. Just prayers for all the lost and struggling, especially through these holiday seasons. You know, we got it good, you know, compared to a lot of people. And, and an update on Dickie, she's no longer actually sick. You can put her back to just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> If you see that on the screen next week, don't be mad at me, okay? I'm just saying. I try to get them all up there. <laughs> I try to get them all up there. <laughs> so, um... If we're not here next week, you'll know why. <laughs> well, if Chris is not here next week, we'll know why. Yeah. <laughs> He'll be sick. <laughs> With a black eye. Go ahead, Kayla. <laughs> Um, I know that you put it on the prayer chain, but um, Steve's friend, Dave Hiley, um, is somebody that he used to rent from and was kind of like a dad friend for a while. Um, 
be a stage four pancreatic cancer. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and um, I talked to his wife. I texted her, letting her know that we pray, we were praying for him and stuff. And um, she said it's really bad. So um, just pray for um, salvation. I think is probably the main one because especially if it isn't gonna be good, that's probably a top one. Okay. Um, and also um, for just um, strength, I guess. But I know he's struggling really hard um, and he's in a dark place. Um, his daughter is also going through a um, really bad divorce with a narcissistic ex-husband that is, she's going through the motions really bad. Her name's Amanda, so if you can okay. keep her in prayer too. Um, we're not too close to the family anymore, but we just feel like um, God's speaking to Steve and I to pray really hard for that family, for salvation especially, because um, I don't think any of them are. Okay. And um, an unspoken for me and patience for me, just patience in every aspect of my life. Patience. Okay. Miss Andrea up here. Are we? Mm. Surgery. She had a detached retina. Surgery went well, but she did have a little bit of a um, longer recovery than what we expected. So. Okay. Got her on my list today too. Who else? Get Miss Karen there. Um, just safe travels for Jocelyn, her mom, and her brother. They're coming in this week, and they'll be here for a while for the holidays. And that they have a wonderful time. All right. Coming from Costa Rica is right. So it's a trip, not just a little trip. It's a big trip. Go ahead, Darlene. Can we just keep remembering my brother Gary in, in prayers? Um, he called me Tuesday that he had to go to Somerset to a doctor that they had got a cancellation if they were able to get him. In. And um, I guess the doctor looked at the last MRI and said, yeah, yeah, you might have had a stroke or there's something up with his brain. Okay. And Ron always says Gary doesn't have a brain, so <laughs> there's something that we know he does. So, okay. But, there's um, something in there, MRIs confirmed. something in there, yeah. Okay. The doctor said he has to look at the last, like, five MRIs that Gary has had to see what changes have come about. But... Um, He's just in a lot of pain a lot of the time. Okay. All right. Who else? Go ahead, Oi. Just uh, keep, uh, our coworker Colleen, her son had a seizure Thursday night. They brought him up from West Virginia to Pittsburgh on a ventilator mm. to him in an induced coma. But her today is out of the coma and off the ventilator. Okay. And it is attributed to energy drinks. Oh. Really? Too many energy drinks at one time. Okay. I've heard of that before too, so monitor that. Uh, I don't know. I don't care which way you go, Mel or Crystal. Um, a praise with a question mark. Um, <laughs> Haley's uh, belly issues that have been going on for months. Um, when they put her on the antibiotic for the strep, about three days into the antibiotic, her belly pain has stopped. Um, and she's had none since. So it's something that I, through my journaling, I noticed right away, and it's the only difference. So mm. it's something that I'll definitely be bringing up to the gastroenterologist in July. It doesn't really give me an answer as to what was causing the belly pain. Right. But it's definitely nice to have a break for her. We've had no issues now for about a week and a half. Good. Um, and we, before that, had maybe had a day at a time that she might have, but we never had two days in a row where she didn't have belly pain. Mm. Um, I don't know if that'll give him any answers or if it's going to cause it, if it's just a temporary break or if it's going to be coming back or what, right. what all that means. But we're, we'll take what we can get where we can get it. So for now, it's definitely a phrase. Could be. Allergy, lactose, something. Yeah, because that antibiotic stuff, that affects with all that gut health. So, good, Mel. 
just an unspoken for me. Okay. Thank you. Miss Mel. Anybody else? Got some stuff? Good. Uh, Stephanie Haddix said that Edie Hubbard is at the hospital and to pray for her. All right. I want to keep Edie in prayer. All right. Anything else? Thanks, Steph, for the update. Appreciate it for Edie. Um, I'm assuming she's in Connemaw, so. Okay. Anybody else? Run that way, Owie. <laughs> I don't know, somebody said something smart back there. I forgot, I also do Bible study um, with a man named Charles. He's taking the uh, Christmas holiday off, but he did end up in the hospital over this week. He did get out, but just proves that he has um, a good recovery so that he can continue doing Bible study. Okay. All right. Yeah, I won't forget mine. I'm just looking around, making sure we're all done. Um, do want to keep uh, Ruth Stevens in prayer. This came from Diane Hosopel. She fell, broke a hip, broke her pelvis, and broke ribs. Is that right? I got that all right. Not broken on the pelvis. Cracked. Okay. Okay, so Miss Ruth, broken hip, broken ribs, cracked pelvis, and they're not going to do any surgery. So I want to keep uh, her in prayer. Also, uh, this comes from Miss Gail. Uh, Norma Santamar, Santmar, is that it? Um, has breast cancer and is choosing the hard decision to have the double mastectomy here next month. So please keep her in prayer, uh, connected to Gail and Tom. I want to keep Bill Roush in prayer as well. Uh, we haven't seen him for a couple weeks. Um, I did get in touch with him, just checking up on him a little bit. Uh, he apparently fell uh, the day before Thanksgiving and he was in the bedroom taking his sweater off and he had some issues getting his sweater off, got a little bit dizzy and he tried to make it to the bed and he fell into his nightstand, broke a couple of ribs and uh, has been in the hospital and the Creighton Center since Thanksgiving. Uh, my understanding in our conversation that he was to be home on Thursday, this past Thursday, I think that's so because he had an Amazon delivery on his porch for two days and it's now off. So either a porch pirate got it or Bill got it, but um, I think that he's home and doing well. He said he was feeling a little better. So uh, keep Bill in your prayers. Want to keep uh, Ralph Albright in prayer too. Uh, Tess is here with the kids today. He sent me a video this week. Uh, he, he works in the tree trimming business. He was cutting trees along a highway and he's showing me pictures of these people zipping on by while they're on the side of the road. And it's uh, dangerous work. So keep those folks that are working out of town, especially in dangerous kinds of things, in your prayers. I want to keep our folks up on Climber in prayer, April Geary dealing with a bunch of asthma and some sort of a work situation that uh, she can't discuss but needs prayer for. I want to keep um, our families that are separated and broken, lost, hurt, as Chris lifted up in our prayers this morning. I want to keep Charlotte and Rod Hillegas in prayer, praise for them. They got to Florida, my understanding, safe and sound. I want to keep little Hudson up here in prayer who's got some stitches in his forehead because he too was trying to uh, have an encounter with the kitchen table or something. Uh, so keep him in prayer and also want to keep uh, Shannon Davis back there in prayer as well for an unspoken. So I think I have them all. Um, any others? Go ahead, Steph, you got some more? Uh, Nancy Hofecker, I'm not sure if that's mom or your wife, but an unspoken. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Good to see you on this morning. All right. Anybody else? Oh, you got one, Oi? Good. Just keep Nancy in your prayers. She's still pretty bad. Yeah. I want to keep Nancy Hofecker, Oi's wife, in prayer. 
because she's not well this morning. Not feeling well, so, okay. Last call. Let's come to the Lord in prayer silently for a, a moment. Lift up uh, your request to God and I'll close this up with prayer and make our way to the message this morning. So join me as we pray. Lord, as we pause this morning and humble ourselves in prayer before you, we're just grateful for this Christmas season, Lord, that rolls around each and every year. We get to tell this age-old story again of the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we know that we humans need to hear this story over and over again because we are a forgetful people. We are a selfish people. We are a people, Lord, that simply decides to be Lord of our own lives and go our own way. So it's, it's good that we can come and hear these biblical stories again and again. How you, Lord, have come to earth to save us really from ourselves, to save us from the devil and sin, to save us from an eternity separated from you. Lord, we know that you are always working to win souls to your kingdom, to depopulate the kingdom of darkness and populate the kingdom of light. So today, Lord, we lift up those that are lost and struggling and families, Lord, with brokenness, Families, Lord, that uh, are separated. Families, Lord, that are struggling. Families that need Jesus, that need to hear this story of the birth of a Savior. Lord, we know that the struggles and chaos in this world is very real. We know that there's truly a battle going on between good and evil. We know, Lord, that in the end, good wins, that you win. But in the meantime, we're here, Lord, to share the truth, to share the gospel, to share the stories that with you nothing is impossible and in the end you win. So, Lord, we pray for the church. We pray for a way of hope. We pray for the churches around us. We pray for the church at large that particularly through this season that we might from the mountaintops and the valleys Shout the name of Jesus and preach truth and preach salvation so that the whole world might know of this great event that happened thousands of years ago for our good and for our behalf. So Lord, we thank you that Christmas rolls around every year. We thank you that we can tell this age-old story again and again. We pray that you would simply open up our hearts and our minds and our ears, Lord, to hear. And we pray that you would help us to make the decision necessary to receive the baby Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Lord, today we lift up this prayer list. There are many concerns here, many unspoken. There's need of healing and forgiveness and grace. There's need, Lord, for emotional help. There's needs for encouragement and blessing. Lord, we pray that you would touch this list in a powerful way. We pray, Lord, that you would bring encouragement to each and every 
name that has been spoken and unspoken. We pray that through this Christmas season, Lord, that you would draw near to your people and that you would comfort them and be with them. Lord, today we're grateful to be gathered together to exalt your name. We lift up the name of Jesus today and we focus on you. We ask all this as we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I was uh, scanning through Facebook this week a couple of times. And uh, <clears throat> my Facebook journey most of the time has to deal with tractors and boats, not so much the personal part of that. The truth is there are some things about you that I don't want to know, you know? So you read those things on Facebook and you go, oh, okay. So I, I don't scan a whole lot. Uh, I probably read more news than I should, but I came across some interesting memes the other day that should, should make us all pause and think. And here's the first one. McDonald's can mess your order up 101 times and you still keep going back. One thing goes wrong in church and you quit. People aren't, just aren't hungry enough. Something we should ponder, and it's true. We've all experienced that. The preacher said something, somebody said something to you, and I'm not going there anymore. Here's the second one. So you don't want to go to his house on earth, yet you expect to live in his mansion in heaven. Think about that statement. Think about that statement. You don't want to come here, but you expect to go to heaven when this life is over. Here's the next one. We take our children to the mall to meet Santa, and I'll add, sometimes we stand in line for hours, right? Why not take them to church to meet Jesus? And I'll add, in the end, which one will make the bigger difference? If I was to ask you who is the most important person in history, what would your answer be? Who is the most important person in history? And to help us answer that question, two guys, a computer scientist, uh, Stephen Skiena, and a Google engineer, Charles Ward, they developed a system that ranks historical figures in order of significance. You know, we're all about statistics today, and we're all about using, uh, uh, you know, computers to uh, calculate the odds of things. Well, these guys, they, they kind of done that, and they wrote a book about it titled, Who's Bigger? Where Historical Figures Really Rank. And just like Google ranks pages, these guys assess more than 800,000 names they calculated their celebrity, their achievements, their seriousness, how long they lived, and how long ago they lived. And they used a system that they created of statistical analysis to rank and compare historical reputations. Uh, as an example, who's bigger, Washington or Lincoln? President Washington or Lincoln? Uh, who's bigger, uh, Hitler? or Napoleon? Who's bigger, Picasso or Michelangelo? Uh, so you understand what they're trying to do? Here are the top 10 most in influential people in history. The very first one in the center of the screen is Jesus. Um, right above him on the right is Napoleon. On the left side, second one down is Muhammad the founder of Islam. Number four is William Shakespeare up there in the right hand corner. You have Abraham Lincoln on the left hand lower corner. You have George Washington in the middle on the right. You have Adolf Hitler on the bottom on the right. You have Aristotle uh, in the, the left side, second row at the top. 
you have Alexander the Great right underneath him, and then obviously Thomas Jefferson, top left corner. Now there are a few other notable names on the list. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, the founder of the Protestant religion, if you will, ranks 17th. Uh, Joseph Stalin um, ranks 18th, right behind Martin Luther. Elvis Presley ranks 68. And the Virgin Mary ranks 128. And eventually then you come to this on the list. At 8,633... You have Justin Bieber. Now I know you guys that grew up in the you know early 2000s, 2008, 9, 10. You know this was uh, and still pretty much is. He's only 29. Wikipedia says that he holds 33 Guinness World Records. Um, he got a ton of musical records. He was one of the youngest people to have you know record albums that were that were on the charts and hits. Time Magazine named Bieber one of the most, one of, one of the hundred most influential people in the world in 2011. Can you imagine Justin Bieber, one of a hundred of the most influential people in the world. He was included on the Forbes list of the top ten most powerful celebrities in 2011, 12, and 13. Which I find rather humorous hyperbole to be honest with you Justin Bieber so how does he compare with Jesus and the authors answer the question this way the significance of Jesus is shown by his mind share today fully 2,000 years after his death we don't see the same happening for Justin Bieber in other words 2,000 years from now no one is going to be talking about Justin Bieber. He won't be taking up any space in people's minds or in their conversations. No one will talk about Justin Bieber. So why is Jesus number one on the list? Well, it has something to do with how successfully is the idea of this person being communicated through time. Right now, there are over two billion followers of Jesus Christ a full 2,000 years after his death. Jesus is an incredibly successful historical individual. Now I think we all understand that fame is a tricky thing. Um, you just have to look at the, the news over the last year or so and see the rise and fall of lots of those internet sensations. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can be an internet sensation today and you can be forgotten, a forgotten has-been tomorrow. And it's that quick. The truth is, if you don't already know this, the glory of the world is fleeting. Everything good, everything bad, everything happy, everything sad, it all passes away. All of it is short-lived. Fame and notoriety have one thing in common. One thing. They both pass away. Fame and notoriety. Um, one of the things I've long said, you know, please don't put my name on buildings or any of that kind of stuff when I'm long gone. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's not what I'm living for. All that kind of fame. Somebody said if you, want, uh, if you want your name to live on forever and ever, you just donate millions of dollars to some college somewhere and your name will go on in perpetuity. Um, don't do that for me. So the question becomes, um, is there anything on this earth that will last forever? So look at these words from Luke chapter 1 and verse 33. Luke 1 and 33 says, He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. What lasts forever? Now, it's pretty easy for us to forget how radical, how radical this must have sounded in the beginning. He's going to live forever. He's going to going to rule forever. Those words were spoken by an angel to a virgin announcing a baby who will one day 
rule the world. How, how radical is that? And it came out of the blue to a teenage girl who was a virgin in Nazareth, a tiny village in the remote corner of the Roman Empire. The angel came to her suddenly and he made a series of incredible announcements. Listen to them in Luke chapter 1 starting in verse 31. The angel said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now Mary could have asked a whole bunch of questions here. Any number of follow-up questions about any one of those things. But we can pretty much assume that Mary was thoughtful and practical. So she asked only about one thing. The first thing that was stated. In verse 34 she says, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. How is this going to be? And the answer was both direct and even more amazing in verse 35. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Translation, nothing is impossible with God. Now, think about how overwhelming all of this is for Mary at the moment. I mean, this is overwhelming information. And look at Mary's cool, calm response in verse 38. I wonder if we would respond the same way in the same situation. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. How would you respond in the same situation? I mean, even now, after 2,000 years, the angel's message seems amazing. What a series of incredible predictions he made. And none more astonishing than that last phrase in verse 33 that says, His kingdom will never end. Anybody here ever listen to the Hallelujah Course? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The Hallelujah Course? Especially that part where the choir at the end, it's rising to this crescendo, repeats, and he shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. And they keep repeating that and it gets... It, 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 it rises into a crescendo, runs chills up and down your spine, doesn't it? Now we're not there yet. But we have to ask ourselves, where is history going? Where is history going? The philosophers have pondered that question for thousands of years. Is history, as Macbeth said, nothing more than a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing? Or is history, as historian Edward Gibbon suggested, little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind? Or maybe we should accept the Hindu view that history is this endless cycle of reincarnation. Or maybe closer to home, we should adopt this vague evolutionary view that we came up from the slime over the course of billions of years. And maybe we should conclude with the cynics that, that life is really meaningless and leads to nothing at all. Now the question is really important. Because the way you view history ultimately shapes the way that you view your own life. If you believe that history is going nowhere, then your life is just a dash between two dates the date of your birth and the date of your death. If history has no goal, then life really has no meaning. 
and every man's really left to his own devices. Now from God's point of view, history really is his story. It's the record of God's dealing with the human race. The Bible teaches us that the universe had a definite beginning at a definite point of time. It was created. Just like that phone you have in your pocket or your purse. That thing does incredibly amazing things today. But it just didn't ooze up out of the slime. It was created. And the Bible teaches that man himself didn't come up from the slime in some crazy accident of evolution. The Bible shows us how history is the slow unfolding of God's purpose on earth. The Old Testament prophets spoke again and again of this coming kingdom on the earth. Abraham got a glimpse of it. Moses saw it from afar. David learned about it directly from God. The prophets filled in all the details. They foresaw a time when God's Messiah would rule the world from David's throne in Jerusalem. If you put the pieces together, they speak of a coming golden age for the earth. In that day, scripture tells us that the lion will lay down with the lamb and all the nations will stream to Jerusalem the New Testament writers add some very significant detail to the story. They promise that the Messiah is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the kingdom of God will not be ultimately established until Jesus the King returns to the earth in person. That's what we're waiting for. And that's where history is going. The kingdom of God is what history is all about. It's the goal towards which everything is moving. It's the last chapter in a story that started in the Garden of Eden. Now, in case you missed it last week, let me recap and give you again what history is all about. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he placed Adam and Eve on the earth and made them stewards over the whole planet. And when they disobeyed God in the garden, they surrendered their stewardship into the hands of Satan. And from that day until this, the whole world has been the domain of Satan. Now make no mistake, it is still God's world by creation. But Satan has unsurped God's authority and he set up this counter kingdom to the kingdom of God. And from that very day until this, the earth has been the central battlefield in a war between those two competing kingdoms. But that's not the whole story. Once the world fell into enemy hands, God determined to win it back at any cost. That meant sending his message through kings and prophets and priests and poets. It meant raising up an entire nation through whom he would bless the earth. But ultimately it meant that he would have to enter into the conflict personally. In order to seize the world back from Satan, God entered the human race in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about the battle in Bethlehem. God declared war there at Bethlehem. Ever since the Garden of Eden, a battle has been raging between God and Satan for the control of the planet Earth. When Adam and Eve sinned, Satan struck a blow for evil. From that time until this very moment, sin has reigned in every corner of this planet and has found a home in every heart on earth. All the pain and suffering that we see around us, every bit of it, can be traced back to that fateful moment in the Garden of Eden. Since then, the armies of evil have been on the attack all around the world. And believe me, I get discouraged. It seems as if the battle is over and evil is going to reign forever. But if Christmas means anything, it's this. 
God wins in the end. God wins in the end. At Bethlehem, he launched this mighty counteroffensive that started with this tiny baby boy named Jesus. He was born in some scandalous ways in a barn to a young couple who were alone. And the world back then had no idea what God was up to. It's only because that we can look back at past events and reflect on them that we even understand much of this story. But now if you run the clock forward, to the end of his life, when Jesus was crucified, it appeared that Satan might win. For 36 hours, it seemed certain he had won, that the battle was over, that God had been decisively defeated. That was until Sunday came. And with it, the empty tomb and the risen Savior. Dennis and I were talking about that today. We should make the tomb maybe our symbol of Christianity. It's the only one, Jesus' tomb is the only one that's ever been empty, right? And at that moment, it became very clear to everyone, even to Satan, that Jesus was the victor in the great battle to reclaim the earth. Now, the truth is the world is still in darkness. But here and there, there are folks like us. There are churches that have established outposts of the kingdom. We're here to help promise better things to come, to preach the gospel, to share the name of Jesus. And all the while, this battle rages on between these two kingdoms, King Jesus on one side, Satan on the other. And in the last 20 centuries, the light has spread until it seems like there's tons of Christians, two billion I said, right? Working to chase away the darkness. But ultimately there are still too many places in the world where things look darker than ever. That's the history of the world up until this very present moment. But that's not the end of the story either. All over the world in these little outposts, these churches, People are praying that, that God's kingdom would come. And as we do, we wait patiently, waiting for the Son of God to personally and visibly return to the earth. And when he comes at last, he's going to trample Satan under his feet. He's going to judge the workers of iniquity. He's going to set the wrongs of the world right. And he is going to reign on David's throne in Jerusalem forever. That day has not yet come. But it will come. And indeed it is coming. And we believe the signs are all around us that the coming of Christ is not far away. But whether it's tomorrow or whether it's a hundred years from now, the kingdom of Jesus will establish on the earth and it forms the goal of all human history. It is the last and greatest chapter in the battle of the ages. Jesus is coming back. I don't know, you've probably heard this before. About a century ago, there were two famous essays that were written about the life of Christ. One of them is One Solitary Life. Have you heard that? The other one is The Incomparable Life. Uh, if you've ever read Josh McDowell's uh, book, he reprinted them both in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And when you combine those two uh, essays, they paint a, a pretty vivid picture of who Jesus really is. So listen. 2,000 years ago, a man was born contrary to the laws of life. He lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He was the child of a peasant woman and worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home, never wrote a book, never held public office. He never went to college. He never set foot in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He possessed none of the usual traits that accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. In his infancy, he startled a king 
In childhood, he puzzled doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature, walked upon the waves as if it was pavement, and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his service. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed on a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed tomb. 2,000 years have come and gone and today he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. He never wrote a book, yet no library could hold all the books written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast of having as many students. He never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun. And yet no leader ever had more volunteers who under his orders have made more rebels stack arms and surrender without a shot fired. He never practiced psychiatry, yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. How great is his influence? All history is divided by his coming. B.C. meaning before Christ and A.D. after death. We live in the year 2023 A.D., right? What does that mean? Two, that's right. 2023 years since the year of our Lord. We do that in the honor of his birth. The names of past leaders have long been forgotten. The great men of Greece and Rome are dusty names in the library of time. Scientists, philosophers, kings, generals, and theologians have come and gone. But the name of this man abounds more and more. Though, th though time has spared, uh, spread 2,000 years between the people of this generation and the scene of his crucifixion, yet he still lives. Herod could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him. He stands alone on the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, and feared by devils. As the living, personal Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the Savior of the world. This is the Christ of the Bible. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the true Christ of the Christian faith. This is the one in whom we have believed. He is our Lord and our Savior. Millions of Christians worship him in every nation on every continent. He's worshiped in India and Japan and Australia and Belgium and Nigeria and Guinea and Pakistan and Costa Rica and Cuba and Bolivia and Canada and Ukraine and Russia and England, Turkey and Israel, China and Paraguay and in every city and every town and every village in America. We celebrate his birthday each year at Christmas and thank God and praise him that we do. Someone once said, if our greatest need had been education, God would have sent a teacher. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us a banker. If our greatest need had been advice, God would have sent a counselor. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent a savior. And his name is Jesus. He is Christ the Lord, the Son of God, who came from heaven to earth. You see, God's answer is all wrapped up in a baby named Jesus. And not just in any Jesus, but only the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in the New Testament. He alone is the Lord from heaven. He alone can save us. 
Those familiar words from O Little Town of Bethlehem by Philip Brooks come to mind right now. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. That's why Jesus is the most important person in history. No one else could do what he has done. That's why his movement now encompasses more than two billion followers. If you're really going to publish a truly accurate list of the most important people in history, Jesus would be number one. And there would be no number two. Because no one compares to him. Billy Graham once said, he hoped the last word he uttered before dying was simply this, Jesus. We can't do any better than that. Jesus has a kingdom and he is building it in, every, in, in human hearts around the world. And someday he is going to return and visibly reign on the earth. That kingdom, his kingdom, will never end. If you haven't discovered this kingdom, if you don't yet know this Savior, I encourage you to invite him into your heart today. If you want to make that commitment of your life to Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I encourage you to pray with me. And pray quietly in your heart this prayer with me. You ready? Join me as we pray. Dear God, I don't want to live one more moment without you. I ask your forgiveness for my sins, for not recognizing your great love for me. I believe Jesus is your son who left heaven and came to earth to die on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead and is alive today he came at just the right time, just for me. Today I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sin, cleanse me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I choose in this moment to receive the greatest gift ever given, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Bible says if you prayed that with a sincere heart, you're now part of the family of God. And one day you will live and reign with him in his kingdom that will never end. Amen? Let's stand and sing.
Have a seat for a minute. As the time comes for the Lord's return, gets closer and closer, we're going to need to be one together more and more. Again, we're stronger together, so keep that in mind. Uh, quick announcements here. Pasta is the collection for the food pantry through the month of December. I did correct that, by the way. So uh, if you can help with that, we'd appreciate it. Got a big corner full of uh, stuffing and stuff over there uh, for the pantry for uh, November. So thank you uh, for that support. Uh, what else? <coughs> Say that again? Oh, yeah, we need to help Kathy get that to the car, too, by the way. She'll deliver it for us down there. Right, Miss Kathy? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, fruit baskets, uh, sign-up sheet is on the back table back there. I think the uh, orders are due by tomorrow. So before you leave today, make sure that if you want a fruit basket that you sign up there, that Daryl and Kathy can put our order in and get them uh, uh, on the way to you. So uh, make sure that you do that before you leave today. Uh, just a few things to know. Again, children's program is the AM service on the 24th. Christmas Eve service is at 7 o'clock on the 24th. The following weekend, 31st Sunday, is bread and cup communion. So uh, prepare for that. Um, again, the Camp Harmony Christmas Cookie Fundraiser orders are due for that by tomorrow. December the 11th, so if you're interested, get those in. And again, just a reminder about the Harmony Light Fest. Um, seemed like there was a lot of uh, traffic up there last night after it got dark around 5.36, 6.37. That time frame was a pretty good showing of cars coming back down. So uh, if you get a chance, go check it out. Again, uh, last call for the Christmas Angel program down at St. Francis Caring and Sharing. If you can help, would like to help a child this year, uh, give them a call and talk to Kim, and I'm sure she'll uh, point you in the right direction and get you fixed up. What else? Oh, Penn State gone. Keep that in mind. I think Abby needs to have uh, um, donations in by the end of January, I think is the correct time frame. So if you'd like to help uh, with Thon and the uh, research on childhood cancer, uh, there's a great place uh, to make some donations. Miss Diane. Last evening, um, Ernie and I went to Grantsville, Maryland to see a Christmas play, not expecting to see what we saw. A thousand people in attendance to see the play, under a tent. It's in the Grantsville Plaza, which is right at the stoplight on 219. Mm. They have live animals, including camels. Mm. They have free treats and food. It was really awesome work, young and old. It lasts, the play lasts about an hour and a half, but it goes so fast. Mm. And it's called The Promise. It starts at six o'clock. I recommend that you were there at five, no later because they turned over 200 people away. Wow. So it's called The Promise. It's a, a Christmas uh, nativity play. Grantsville, Maryland, uh, at the stoplight on 219, under a tent, had a thousand in attendance last night. Um, if you're gonna go, it's free, I'm assuming. Free admission, got snacks and things after. And uh, you- The snacks are before. Oh, snacks are before. It was next to a meal for Ernie and I. It was not just snacks, it was good. Okay, um, so be there by five, because they turned a couple hundred people away, so if you want to go. Uh, again, Grantsville, Maryland, 219 stoplight, uh, starts at 6 o'clock, nativity kind of play. Live animals and everything, so hey, okay, thanks for the update, I appreciate that. What else? As we leave this place and scatter back out into the world, may the God of hope who loves us and gave himself for us fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him today and throughout the week coming, so that in believing, we may abound in hope through the love of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Go with God's blessings. Go in peace. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Be safe out there. Don't get caught up in all that Christmas shopping. Thanks for joining us online. It is the Christmas season. We'll see you back here at 10 o'clock Sunday.